Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Steve Tatiotian of Infineon. I'm going to talk today about changes in motor control. Steve, motor control has been around for a very long time. We've had chips going into that for decades. What's changing now and what's driving it? So we absolutely have had chips that are capable of spinning a motor for decades. What we see changing in the market, though, is an increased push towards efficiency, and that's driving the need for new motor types in a wider range of applications, as well as new control topologies, specifically as we move a lot of traditionally wall-powered applications to become battery-powered. The end result of that, then, is a need for tighter control loops and higher switching frequency capabilities on the microcontrollers. And this goes into a lot of different markets too, right? It's not just industrial. There's, it's everything now because this control is now capable of everything from your home all the way up to your office and into specific vertical markets. Absolutely. We see a, a demand for these types of products, spinning motors in a more efficient or in a quieter way across a range of home applications, and that can be from power tools to your vacuum, both your stick vacuum, the motor there, as well as driving your robotic vacuum around around the room to clean up while you're not home. We also see, frankly, the same kind of need in, in uh, home appliances and air conditioning units as well. And there we also we see, in addition to this efficiency pull, this demand to really integrate more capabilities into the microcontroller, for example, in outdoor units for residential air conditioning, controlling two motors at once, plus doing the, the, the PFC control. So more capabilities built into these devices to control more sophisticated motors and motor topologies. Yeah. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Steve, what are we looking at? So here, what we're showing here is what I just kind of went through specifically around efficiency and tighter control loops and motor control applications and the kind of end products that drive those needs. In addition, though, and I think it's it's probably well understood by the audience here, is that motor control is is indeed a you know a power conversion application. And another one of those that we see is around power supplies, right? And we see a, a similar trend there in terms of more efficiency and faster switching speeds. And the reason there is a slightly different, which is as these, for example, server and AI server farms go to higher and higher power levels and higher and higher power densities, they're making this transition on the power device side to wide band gap semiconductors like SICK and GAN. And those devices were able to control at even much higher frequencies than traditional motor control applications. And that, again, you know, serves from uh, increasing the power density on those power supplies, as well as the, which is a result of the overall efficiency gains from the wide band gap devices. What does the market look like for all this stuff? So when we look at the market for these types of products focused on motor control and power conversion applications, uh, today we see about a 1.7 billion euro opportunity growing at 7% to reach to about 2.3 billion in, in, in fiscal year 29. And then we look at power conversion. It's a little bit smaller market today at 0.8 billion, but growing a little faster than the motor control market as specifically driven by things like the AI servers. I mentioned earlier, there's also an aspect here around the end application in those segments around home appliance being, being a large pull, especially on the motor control side other smart home applications, and then a range of industrial applications, both on motor control and on power conversion. Is that growth rate faster than it was in the past? For specifically these types of products, yes. We see you know, continued growth in home appliances. And as I mentioned, there are some trends around more integration. That means sometimes more motors. It means motors plus other functionality as well. We see this pull on renewables, and that's from an energy generation distribution and then, of course, consumption perspective. And that is a, is a big shift that we see on battery powered applications or electrification on light electric vehicles and, and smart home products like I show over here with the vacuums and lawnmowers and, and, and power tools. And then server telecom applications for power supply specifically. And then again, a, a range of, of industrial applications. And what we see being kind of necessary to address this range of applications, whether that be 
across product categories or even within a category when we see kind of a, a good, better, best approach from OEMs is a necessity to, to supply a broad, scalable portfolio of MCUs that meet these requirements. We often say that, you know, when somebody selects an MCU, they're making an investment decision because they're investing, that developer is investing their time to write the software for that product. So one focus, of course, for us is, is to make that easy to use. So providing the right tools and software to, to help developers move quickly, but the broad scalable portfolio helps them reuse that investment across products and across applications. But a couple of things here that isn't always prevalent in, in, in these applications, which we see as, as becoming more and more required in the market are things around security. So we see security becoming more relevant across the board here. And that's some of these devices for you know OTA or telemetry requirements, and that can be in in server telecom, for example, but also for IP protection as developers want to protect their IP, again, their software on these devices to make sure it's secure. The other thing that we're seeing, of course, I think in, in appliances, we've seen class B requirements for a long time around functional safety, but now we're seeing a broader uh, demand for SEAL 2 certification on these end applications. So we're making these products SEAL 2 ready uh, as well. And looked at from a high level, really what this is all about is that everything is now connected sometimes to each other, but certainly to the internet, right? That's right. That's right. We're seeing more and more of that power tools talking to phones, which are talking to the cloud, right? I mean, you wouldn't, wouldn't have expected that maybe five years ago, but that's happening now. And, and that, of course, creates a security concern in some cases and forward looking, you know, we're building in the security capabilities to protect these devices. So what actually is changing here? What are you building in that wasn't there before? That's a great question. And here what I have is kind of the block diagram of, of one of these microcontrollers that is kind of ready for this next generation, revolving generation of motor control and power conversion designs. So what we have, of course, is, is a Cortex-M33 at 180 megahertz kind of as the, the root of, of the control system. Of course, it enables Trust Zone, which is part of that, that PSA Level 2 certification. There's other things on here, which I'll talk about a little bit on security in terms of crypto and, and, and random number generator that enable those security functions to run in a secured manner. The other thing, of course, is ample memory on the device. So embedded non-volatile memory up to 256K bytes, which is kind of a a spot right now that enables a wide range of these devices to actually have dual bank. So two versions of their application in the device at any given time, one to support rollback. So if I have a need to update in the field, I can update one bank of flash while the device runs out of the other and then make the switch. If, for example, there is a, a bug in that new software update, we can support rollback to the previous version. And that's enabled through multi-bank flash, for example, these devices or these applications continue to consume more and more RAM as well. So we support up to 64 K bytes of RAM as well. And because these devices often go into applications that have a safety requirement around them, you know, we, we add ECC on both our RAM and our flash memories embedded on these devices to, to increase that level of robustness of the technology. Fundamentally, however, what I want to talk about is in this real-time control block here, and this is where I think we really see the impact of these changes that we've been talking about. So really high-speed ADCs, so up to 12 mega samples per second, really high-speed timers as well with these high-resolution PWMs, for example. And then we also put some specific acceleration in, which we call this, this Cortic Accelerator here, as well to offload the M33 in some cases. So again, really enabling a rich and tight set of capabilities for high-speed control loops. Underlying all this is, is power conversion too, right? Because now you're starting to move into new materials, wide band gap materials, GAN, potentially SICK. What do they bring to the table that you didn't have before? So what they bring to the table is more efficient conversion of power. So, and, and they do that through enabling higher switching speeds in the devices. And then 
what needs to happen, of course, and this is both in motor control where we're specifically seeing a, a pull for GAN-based motor control, as well as in power supplies for GAN and, and SIC, for example. And then what that demand on the higher switching frequency, again, which enables more efficient power conversion, shows up in these products, specifically, as I mentioned earlier, in the high-speed ADCs and this high-resolution PWM. So really, really enabling fine control loops operating at, at very high speeds. With these wide band gap materials, you also can go higher voltage too, right? So you can play that off against current. How much heat do you have? How efficient you need to make these things? That's right. And that all comes into how developers can optimize the power density in their systems. And then that shows up, of course, in terms of end users. It could be in your in your stick vac. If we're talking about GAN-based motor control, it could be a lighter battery, it could be a smaller form factor, it could be longer battery life, for example. This is, to some extent, really about know your neighbor, what they're doing, right? Yeah, exactly. So how, how these devices work together is important. To get the best out of both devices, you absolutely you need to know your neighbor, but the end result of knowing your neighbor is you get the best system performance in the application. In addition to know your neighbor, you also have to know what else is going on around you. So it, it's the entire ecosystem, right? How do you, and there's a big software component in here as well that has to address a lot of this stuff. You're absolutely right. And here's an example of that. So what we deliver is a software ecosystem built within what we call Modus Toolbox. That includes the application level software. It includes all of our driver software. It includes an IDE, which is very flexible, uh, it includes debugger, trace box, for example, so you can see what's going on inside the, the microcontroller. So this is all part of that package I mentioned earlier around helping developers move fast in terms of their application development. The other thing, though, that builds on this or sits inside of this is specific application development then as well. And when we to link back to this know your neighbor comment is really being able to see from an overall system perspective what's happening there. So we also offer tools built into Modus Toolbox called Motor Suite that is a combination of visualization and configuration tools for developers. You've got two trends going on here. One is that you can make trade-offs now that you couldn't do before because you have that kind of granularity. The second thing is that every component in a system now has to be energy efficient, right? That's right, that's right. Especially those that are kind of at the heart of the system and, and let's say mostly always on. One of the big changes here also, and we mentioned this briefly, involves security because now that everything's connected, there are many ways into a system. And once you get into that system, particularly in the hardware, you can now move all the way down the line to whatever it's connected to, right? That's right. And when we talk about security, we're also often talking about safety because those two things are actually pretty tightly linked because if your security doesn't secure the device, then it can potentially either intentionally or inadvertently end up operating in an unsafe mode. Has this changed now that we're getting into more heterogeneous designs? In the past, I think a lot of this was perimeter security, where if you thought, you know, okay, if we could secure the system, nothing else can get in, we don't have to worry about it. Now it's come down to secu let's secure every individual component in here. Yeah, I think we're still, I mean, from an industry perspective, let me put it this way, I think we're still living in, in both of those worlds. Some some uh, applications uh, or some developers may take that first approach, which is I'm just going to lock the door, but what happens inside, not too concerned about. But I do think there is this trend like, oh, I need to be concerned about all of these places because what if I think I locked the door, but I left the window open, for example? I better be sure that those other components are also secure. Um, so we are seeing more and more of that. You're absolutely right. And this here, I mean, in most applications, this is pretty deeply embedded. And the idea that these also need to be secured is really, I think, taking shape in the industry. So looking out in the future here, we've obviously seen, seen the trend from where it was before to what it is now. How do you see this changing? Is it going to be more of the same? We're just going to get more and more granular, better at what we do, or will there be more significant changes? So I think in the, in the short to midterm, there's a big leap that's happening right now around this wideband gap uh, power device adoption. These devices you know, that we talked about here today are, are ready for that. And I think then 
what that means is we're going to see kind of evolutionary improvement on the types of things that we talked about today in terms of control loops and, and security and safety capabilities of these products. However, over the mid to long term, I would expect, though, that we'll see some more disruptive things come into these spaces as developers seek to continue to really push the envelope in terms of power efficiency of these applications. Steve Tatoshin, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you. My pleasure.